thank you for being here tonight and for your interest in spiritual things. And I hope you will take your Bible and follow very closely and listen carefully, knowing that God is watching us. I'm going to try to do my best to present the Word of God. And our responsibility is to treat it like it is the Word of God. And it is. So, this lesson is, as you can see on the screen, is a basic lesson. Probably one of the most basic lessons that you will ever hear. Many have heard it numerous times. Some may have not considered it before. Uh, That is, in reference to your own life and your own attitudes, we all have to come to a point where we understand the gravity of the situation of life and what what it is that we're trying to do as we journey through this thing called life. One of the basic things is we need to know what it's about and what it's not about. In the book of Ephesians, Paul reminded the brethren about their own conversion. He talked about the fact that they had once been dead. And what he meant by that is that they were spiritually dead. The reason that they were spiritually dead is because they had become entangled in sin. In Ephesians chapter 2, he says, you were dead in trespasses and sins. So that made them then to be separated from God. Of course, that's that's the case with all of us. We become dead to God. We are alive to sin, but dead to God. We are dead in sin trespasses and sins. And he goes on to talk about that that was the way you once walked. When you walked according to the course of this world, you were just doing what everybody else was doing, and that was living oblivious to God and His will for your life. So you were just fitting in and doing what everybody else was doing, and the prince of the power of the air was just really happy about that, and that's the devil. He was just really happy that these influences of the world that creates this situation of spiritual death, that that had entangled each and every person. He's happy if that will stay the case, that people will be dead to God and alive to sin, which will in the end take every one of us to hell with Satan. Satan just wants to despise God, do something to despise God. So he wants to carry as many people to hell with him as he can. And people just go along (laughs) blindly. Conversion is so important because it changes that direction. And so he talks about the fact that by grace... You have been saved, verse 5. By grace, you Christians, he's writing to, have been saved. Something changed from their old situation to a new situation. They were buried with Christ and they were raised up together and made to sit in the heavenly places in Christ. That's an entirely different situation than before. And so really that's the basic thing. That's just what what happens when a person is in one situation and then turns around and goes in another direction. So really we're going to talk about what do you do? What happens when conversion truly takes place in the heart? What happens? There are a couple of passages I'd like to start off with. I'd like to look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, where Jesus talked about the necessity of conversion. And he talked about it this way. He said, Matthew 18, verse 3, And assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted... And become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you will stay on the course that you're on and you will not make it to heaven. So we have to become converted and become as little children. And then in the reading in Acts that we uh, heard just a moment ago and read together in Acts 3, verse 19, Peter appealed to the Jews to repent. 
and be converted. There is a repentance, there is a change of mind and will, and then there is a turning of direction that takes place. So what we're going to look at is what is that? What do you mean when you talk about conversion? What is it? How does it happen? And more importantly, has it happened in you and me? First thing I'd like to do in describing what is conversion is just use a simple illustration. If you have a power outlet in the wall, usually a power outlet in the wall means that there is current. It comes through. It's a certain kind of, of power. It's called AC power. Now, if you want to plug your laptop computer or something like that, if you want to get power to that computer, you have to change that current to a different kind, a different form of of power. And what that means is it's got to be converted over to what is called DC power. That's the same thing as, as batteries, batteries bring a certain kind of power, but it's not AC power, it's DC. All right, well, that's the same thing. When you, get, when you have this little device, it is called a converter. It converts from AC to DC. That's all it is. It is a converter. So what does conversion mean? Well, it just means to change, to turn. It means to change the direction or the form or the pattern from one condition to a, an entirely different condition. So that's really all it means. When you're converted, you want to know that there has been a change that has taken place. I was going in this direction, and now I'm going in the opposite direction than I was going in. I was patterning my life and conforming to the world. Now I'm being transformed by a new way of thinking. And so there is a pattern that changes, a pattern of lifestyle, a pattern of of decision-making, a pattern of choice, a pattern of friends and friendships. Everything changes. Everything about our life changes when conversion takes place. And there are different degrees and, and needs within that process. For example, if you had some Jews, for example, who had been living by the law of Moses all of their lives, they had been good in their respect for the law of God, but they know that they have sinned and they always try to appeal to God's mercy for forgiveness of that sin. And so they're relatively a good moral people. But conversion to Jesus Christ means I've got a new head and I've got a new law. I've got, I'm, go, I'm going in a different direction. It may not change me a whole lot morally. I may, may, may sustain the same degree of moral excellence as I had been, but I've got a new direction that I'm taking. Whereas on the other hand, if you had been a Gentile who has been wrapped up in paganism, idolatry, and sexual immorality, and all these immoral things, conversion to Jesus Christ would become more apparent. Like, for example, in 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul talked to the Corinthians, and he says that some of you were homosexuals, some of you were adulterers, some of you were, and he lists a whole bunch of things that they were in the past, but then they were washed, and then they were justified, and they were sanctified. What happened is that they had been converted from one lifestyle to another direction in their lives. So it means to change your direction. It means to turn from one direction and go another direction, and that may demand a lot of different things to different people. To Cornelius, who was a man who already feared God. It was just a a change of who he was depending on for forgiveness of sins. But 
little change in his behavior as far as moral choices and and, and but some people have to make tremendous changes in moral choices than they had been on before. So conversion though means I'm changing directions and I'm changing it in a in a different way and it may demand a lot of different things for different people. In Acts 14 verse 15 here's the same word converted except it's used this time to say in the King James New King James version or the King James says to turn. It says sirs why do you uh, why do ye these things we also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities which would include idolatry and what went along with that usually was sexual immorality uh, you need to turn from these things that are vain they're vanities but when you turn from one thing you turn to another thing And so he says, turn from the vanities, these vanities, and turn unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and everything that is in it. In other words, change direction. That's what conversion means. So now we know what it means. Now let's think about how does it happen. How does it happen that some people are converted? And some people are not. Well, here's, a, here's something that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, verse 15. He's telling why it doesn't happen in some cases and why and what would have to take place in order for conversion to take place in other cases. But he says, the reason it's not happening among this people, he says, for this people's heart is waxed gross. It has been... It has been uh, Grossed over. I mean, immorality and, uh, has calloused their ability to feel their uh, and to be sensitive to the right relationship with God. And so this people's heart is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing. You can talk and they don't hear a thing you're saying, they hear, they hear audible sounds. But they're not interested. They are dull of hearing. There are some people that just don't listen. They hear a sound coming from the pulpit or from a class and and it just doesn't phase them. Why? Because they're dull of hearing. Their ears are not alert to spiritual things. And he says their eyes they have closed. Why did they do that? Some people are just afraid. Some people are afraid to be converted. They're afraid of change. And so he says, they've done this to their hearts, to their their eyes, to their ears, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and should be converted. They don't want conversion to take place. They're afraid of it. And some people are wax gross in that regard because they're afraid that, well, my friends, they won't, they won't like me anymore. And they'll think I'm strange. And they'll think and that we're afraid of what people are going to think. And so he says, that's what you do. You keep working on that heart until you justify not going in the direction you need to when just a, a, an honest heart is all it takes. An honest and open heart is all it would take to hear the correct information, to sink into the heart and, and the, the power of it would sink into their understanding. They would see what they need to do. And then that, that, the power of the gospel would just start changing their priorities, start changing their mind about things, what's important to them and, and what friends they need to have. And, and it, it will change them, but they're converted. And they're glad to be converted. In every case of conversion that you read about in the book of Acts, nobody was ever sad and disappointed that they had been converted to the Lord. Most people are sad that they didn't convert earlier, but none were ever sad 
that they were converted to the Lord out of an old way of thinking, an old way of, of living. So how does that happen? Well, you got to do something to the heart. You got to do something to the ears. And you got to do something to the eyes. And so let's look at it this way. There has got to be something that you see. I'm not talking about physically seeing. I'm talking about in the same way Ephesians 1.18 when Paul wrote to the Ephesian brethren. He says, I want the, I, I'm praying brethren that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. That's the eyes. You can be a physically blind person, but the eyes of your understanding can still be enlightened. There is something you've got to see with the eyes of your understanding. And once you see that, then conversion can take place. But if you don't let yourself see it, then conversion will not take place. Some people are afraid of being converted. And so they don't want to see this. I know where you're going with this. I know what it would take. And if I listened to this, I'd have to change a lot of things. Well, that would be good, wouldn't it? Be good to change a lot of things if need be. There is something to see. And there is also something to hear. If we could let our hearts and our minds at least hear the evidence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's powerful. It is the most powerful, life-changing, mind-changing thing on the face of the earth. Paul, or the writer of Hebrews says, it's quick and powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It gets down to the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I mean, it is powerful. If there's anything that converted, can convert us, it's what we would hear through our listening ears. There's something to hear. And if you hear it, then that would lead to understanding something. And Jesus says, some people just don't want to understand it. Because they're afraid. They're afraid lest they should be converted. So how does it happen? Well, I've got to see something with the mind, with my heart. I've got to hear something. And if I hear that evidence and understand that evidence, it has the power to change my mind, change my direction, and start a transformation process that will carry me through this life and prepare me for the next one. So how does it happen? Well, it happens by hearing and seeing understanding. So I want us to take our Bibles now and go over to the book of Galatians because I want us to see just a particular section of this book that tells us the how and the how not of conversion. How does it take place and how does it not take place? Well, here in, in Galatians chapter 2, look at verse 16. He says, Knowing that a man is not justified, and we're talking about being made right before God, justified, made right before God, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Now get this very carefully here. I cannot just merely hand you the law of Moses. That's the law that we're talking about. And you can see that in the context. That I can't just hand you that law and you be converted to God and justified before God. So the how not is you are not justified by the works of the law. But you are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we uh, have believed in Christ, we Christians have believed in Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ... We ourselves are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. 
For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. I can't go back. If I'm by faith, I am justified and I've created this new relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I can't go back and rebuild things that have been destroyed, whether it be my old lifestyle or whether it be my relationship to the law of Moses. I I can't rebuild that. So he says in verse 19, for I through the law, that is I had the law, let's just take, pretend that I'm holding the old law right here. And I'm, I, I threw the law, I died to the law. Why? Because I was frustrated with it, I was not able to keep it. And therefore I knew that all it was doing was condemning me. And it wasn't helping me deal with the issue of the guilt of my sin. So I died to the law that I might live to God. And notice what happens in verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. How did I die to the law? Something inside me died when I came to faith in Jesus Christ. And when I came to faith in Jesus Christ, the old me became crucified with him. That is, I saw all of my sin bundled up. And Jesus was there willing to pay for my sin. And so I did not desire sin anymore. And so I became crucified with him. And now he says, and it is no longer I who live. So let's look at this and see what happens. Here's a a case of how conversion, true conversion before God takes place. It didn't happen by the law of Moses. The law of Moses did not make us right with God. It could not do that. If it could have done that, then we didn't need Jesus dying on the cross. And so I did not convert to God and become right with God by the law of Moses. The law of Moses did this for us. It told us you need Jesus. You need him. But you're not going to be saved just by having the law of Moses. So, how did it happen? It wasn't this way, but it was this way. It was by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, look at the things that are included. Some people say, all you got to do is just mentally believe. I want you to notice in this text that there are things involved in faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ includes certain things. That's kind of like an umbrella word, and it's got a lot of things packaged under it. What's included in this faith in Jesus Christ? Well, dying to the law. That's one of the things. If I have faith in Jesus Christ, I know that I'm not going to be saved by the law. So I die to the law that couldn't save me to start with. That means, therefore, that I'm not going to be under its rule anymore. And another thing is packaged under the word faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, you don't have faith in Jesus Christ that saves and converts unless there is a dying to the law and then being crucified. The the you that used to guide every decision you made in, the, in life, that was the old you. But faith in Jesus Christ demanded that you, cru- you be crucified with Christ. And if you believed in Jesus Christ and you believed in his death on the cross for you, you did die to sin and you died to the law and you became crucified with Christ. And it is no longer... I that lives. It's not me. The old Terry is gone. He died. No longer I who live. Well, what's what's going on? Well, Christ. It's all about Christ. Now, it used to be all about me. Now, it's got to be all about Christ. 
And sometimes we got to be remember, we got to be reminded that that's what it is, because the old flesh tries to tries to creep back up and come back to life, and so we've got to beat it back down. But what I'm saying is, I used to not even fight it, and now there is a fight. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I want to point out another thing that's involved in the same book. Chapter 3, verse 26 and 27, he says to these Christians, he says, You're all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, which includes what? Being crucified with him, no longer you who live, and Christ lives in you, and you die into the law of Moses. So you're all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And he explains that a little further in verse 27. He says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, so I know this then, faith in Jesus Christ includes, it doesn't exclude, it includes being baptized into Christ and putting on Christ. So when people try to exclude baptism, they don't believe in Jesus. They've got another one, but they don't have the right Jesus. Baptism is part of believing in Jesus Christ. It comes just as surely as being crucified with Christ. Because when you're baptized, you are burying that old crucified person behind in baptism. And you're joining yourself in union with Christ. And you're putting on Christ. It's putting off something else and putting on something else. Putting off off one thing, your former life, putting on another one. So, as it happened, there's something that you heard, something that you understood, that changed your mind, that killed your feelings about sin. It killed your desire to keep living that way. And it created a new direction before you. And so you took it. You turned around. Now, with those things, just keeping those points in, dying to the law, crucified with Christ, no longer I who live, Christ lives in me, baptized into Christ, put on Christ. Let's look at, look at some cases of conversion where those things are clearly taking place. You're converting from a life that's all about me And you're converting to a life that is now all about Christ. Okay? So let's look at some examples. I'm going to look at two examples. Of course, the most obvious is the first conversions on the day of Pentecost. Now let's understand, here are 3,000 Jews. There are more there, but some of them had, had tuned out. Their hearts had become gross. Their ears were dull of hearing. Their eyes, they had closed. They were afraid. They didn't want to be converted. So they didn't obey the gospel. So let's focus in on the 3,000 that did. Let's see how the conversion process took place. Well, the one thing that becomes obvious is that they had lived by the law of Moses. They had had the law of Moses all of their lives. So it was not by the works of the law of Moses that these people became justified and set right with God and converted to God? No, they had that. In spite of having that, though, they needed to be converted. The law of Moses did not do it. How were these 3,000 converted? Well, Peter convinced them with the evidence. And if they had good hearts, they didn't... They didn't become dull of hearing. They were willing to see the evidence. Then Peter presented this sermon in Acts chapter 2 and he told them the evidence of Jesus, the prophecies about him, the uh, eyewitness that even they had seen some of his miracles. I mean, the evidence was clear. And then we saw him alive again. I mean, you crucified him with lawless hands, but but he was raised And we saw him. 
And so the evidence was powerful. He says, this Jesus that you crucified is now both Lord and Christ. What, did he, what is he doing? He's giving them the evidence. So the evidence was powerful. And in verse 37 it says, now when they heard this, and as if they weren't dull of hearing, if they hadn't let their hearts become wax gross so that they would not, they, then 3,000 people heard it. And they couldn't deny it. And when they heard this, it says they were cut to the heart. And they cried, men and brethren, what shall we do? And they knew they were not justified by the law of Moses. And Peter had told them that Jesus is both Lord and Christ. And so they said, well, what shall we do? Apparently they believed that Jesus is now both Lord and Christ. But what do you do? How does conversion to the Lord take place if I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Well, here's what we see happening. These people, by faith in Jesus Christ, died to the law that they knew all of their life could not save them. And so they became crucified with Christ. Something inside them died. Men and brethren. I mean, it wasn't... Just a casual, men and brethren, what shall we do? It was, I can just imagine that it was more like, wow, men and brethren, what shall we do? I mean, with, with all the passion that you can imagine, the desperation was probably clearly in their voices, desperately wanting to know, what shall we do? And Peter told them to repent. And that's a turning around, a changing of the mind. Now there will be evidence of that, but you, that's the first thing. You've got to change the way you've been living and thinking. Repentance. Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he tried to reason with them a little further. But with many other words he testified and he exhorted to them, Save yourselves or be saved from this untoward generation. What he's talking about, this evil generation. Don't be, don't be a part of it anymore. Be saved from it. And so he's describing the conversion process that doesn't come by the law of Moses. And you cannot be justified by that. But it is this way. Remission of sins is this way. And with remission of sins, they put Jesus on. You can't put Jesus on while you retain your sins. You have to have the sins washed away. That's why the people in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says you were this way but you were washed. With remission of sins you put Jesus on now. I'm going to wear new garments of life. A new way of life. Now let's take another case conversion. Another simple one. Turning over to Acts chapter 8 this time you see a religious man in this case. He had been to Jerusalem and he had been a worshiper of God, but he's not right with God. You see, the law of Moses did not make a person right with God. So in Acts chapter 8, I'm referring to the Ethiopian eunuch. As he's leaving Jerusalem and he's going back home to Ethiopia, he is riding along in his chariot and he's reading the book of Isaiah. And particularly, he's reading Isaiah 53. Now, God says to Philip, join that chariot. See that chariot? You join that chariot. I, I, want, I want you to talk to that man. Now, here's a heart. It's not wax gross. It's ready to hear. It's willing to hear. It's willing to understand. And if he understands, he will be converted that's how it takes place. But he has had the law of Moses, 
And the law of Moses does not save him. It does not justify him. And he needs to be right with God. And when Philip joined him, he says, Do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, which indicates his heart is not wax gross. He can listen. I'm open. I will listen to the evidence. So he listens. He says, who is this prophecy talking about? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about some other man? And Philip took him from that scripture and he started telling him that Jesus fits this, Jesus fits that, Jesus fits this. It's really all about Jesus. Now once he understood how the prophecy applied to Jesus... And his heart was not wax gross. His ears were not dull of hearing. He was open-minded. He was willing to see with the truth. Then what happens is he dies to the law of Moses as a means of justification. And he believes in Jesus. He says, here's some water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, well, if you believe with all your heart, you may. See, he's doing the same thing as the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. He's doing the same thing that we saw in the book of Galatians. What he's doing is by faith in Jesus Christ, he too is dying to the law that couldn't save him, and he's turning to someone who can save him. And so he becomes crucified with Christ. The passions and his desires, all of those things, he is, he's with the with the imagery of Jesus taking all of that sin upon himself, this man becomes crucified with Christ. And I know that's a mental thing. It's a spiritual thing, but it is involved in the process of repentance. And being baptized into Christ means I'm ready to put Jesus Christ on. With remission of sins... He too put on Jesus Christ. Now with those two examples of conversion, you could multiply that all through the book of Acts, but those are two very clear. Now let's go back just a moment to the book of Galatians. I want to capture one more statement there. I want to look at uh, Galatians chapter 2 again. And I'd like us to notice verse 20 once again, but I'm going to go a little further this time. I have been crucified with Christ. Now, that wasn't his thinking before when he was persecuting Christians, but it is now. He's telling us what had become true of him. I have become crucified. With Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He's claiming all of that for himself. Jesus had him in mind, but he also had you in mind. He had me in mind. So you ought to be able to say, The same thing, I have become crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. I could and I did for a long time. I just set it aside. I said, not now. Not for me. I set it aside. And while I was setting it aside, my heart was going, going, growing gross. My ears were dull of hearing. But there came a point when he, there was a breakthrough. When he quit sealing his heart over with his own selfish, self-centered thoughts. And he says, I'm not going to set aside the grace of God. Don't set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And one thing, brethren, we don't want to happen is that we let Jesus die for nothing in regard to us. 
So, there is a motto that we ought to look at. We fix this in the tablets of your heart. Put it on the refrigerator. Put it on your mirror. But look at, make this your motto because this seems to be the motto of conversion to Jesus Christ. This is what Paul's motto is. It's no longer I. It was, but no longer. Christ. It's about Christ. And Christ lives in me. Now, can you say that? If you can say that, then you've been converted. If you have been baptized into Christ and you put on Christ, then you've been converted to Christ. And it's no longer you who live. So, here are the effects. There are certain effects that take place in conversion. The effects are these. I'm at peace with God. I know that if I die, it's all right. Not because I deserve anything except to go to hell, but because of faith in Jesus Christ, I have peace with God. That's wonderful. I used to not have peace with God. But peace with God is a wonderful thing to know if it's right. It's right with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Everything becomes new. What kind of things? Well, you get to start all over again. That's, that's a new thing. Getting to start new with God. Another effect is you you got a new purpose for living it's no longer about you it's now about Christ and it's about doing the will of Christ it's a new priority too everything's new I've got new priorities things that used to be important are now garbage rubbish but now the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus gives me a new priority in life a new set of values Things that used to be valuable to me are not valuable anymore. I've got a new set. That's the way Paul describes it in Philippians 3. I've got a new destiny. There's somewhere I'm trying to go with this. Somewhere Jesus wants me to go. A new destiny. I've got a goal now. I've got somewhere to go with this. Formerly, I didn't have a goal. Now I've got a new destiny. Everything's new. And I got a new hope. That's something to make sure that we can have by the process of conversion to Jesus Christ. If you have need for that tonight, you see the value of it, and your heart is not wax gross. Are you ready to turn? You got to be ready. Don't set aside the grace of God. The grace of God makes it possible for you to be clean, start all over again, have all these great new things. And wouldn't it be a shame to miss out just simply by the hardness of heart setting aside the grace of God and says, I'm going to continue the direction I'm going. And the song we're about to sing, Just As I Am, I was kidding Rusty about it a moment ago. It doesn't mean stay as you are, but come as you are as a person who does not have a plea before God. You don't have any way to say, I'm right with God and God, I've got demands on you. No, I'm just as I am a person who doesn't have a plea. That's how God wants us to come. If you have need to obey the God.